Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to uh, this uh, interactive session on uh, trading and investing for global prosperity. Uh, I'm Razin Sali. Uh, I'm uh, based at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. Uh, and I have a distinguished lineup of, uh, of, uh, of speakers uh, on the theme. Uh, uh, with, uh, with a very interesting public sector, private sector mix. I will introduce them in uh, due course and also give you a brief idea of the format of the session. Uh, let me say initially this is a session that's on the record, uh, so all media people are, are welcome. Um, let, me, uh, let me frame the topic uh, to begin with briefly uh, and then, uh, then introduce the panelists. Uh, what's at issue here is uh, opportunities for cross-border trade and investment in an uncertain and certainly not benign global economic climate. So we have continued anemic growth in the West or most of the West in the wake of the global financial crisis and that looks set to continue for years to come perhaps. Uh, we have of course a very different, more rosy picture in uh, many emerging markets, particularly in this part of the world, but as recent trade data, if you read your newspapers uh, and seen your TV screens this morning, uh, you will know that uh, the recent trade data from China and indeed from other parts of Asia looks pretty bleak at the moment on both imports and exports. So we are seeing a growth slowdown. Uh, in this part of the world, not least given depressed export markets in Europe in, uh, in particular. So that's the environment. What are the opportunities out there for global trade and investment in that environment? That's the very big picture. Let me, let me take maybe three aspects of it uh, and invite the panelists to, to consider them as we roll through the discussion. Uh, one is, how does trade fit into broader national or regional competitiveness? Uh, the Global Competitiveness Report of the World Economic Forum came out just about a week ago. Uh, it ranks 144 economies uh, along all sorts of indicators, but one of the important indicators is international trade, read trade and foreign investment. And there, if you just look at Asia, we see wide variation from some who are at the very top, like Hong Kong and Singapore, to others who do very poorly, uh, including some big emerging markets, uh, with China doing relatively better than others, but not nearly as good as some in this part of the world. So how does trade figure in terms of broader competitiveness is one big question. Another one concerns global supply chains, uh, and that's going to be a key feature of our discussion. Uh, supply chains take many forms, but a signal feature of supply chains is what is called production sharing in this part of the world, in East Asia, where we see production highly fragmented and then vertically integrated to cater to markets all over the world, but particularly, over 50%, that is, final markets still in the West, mainly in North America and, and Europe. Um, now, that raises a whole series of questions. How can supply chains cope and prosper even in a climate of slowdown for final markets in the West? Can these supply chains diversify to cater to final markets increasingly in other emerging markets? Can we see more intra-Asian supply chains where we have regional production for regional consumption Supply chains uh, are particularly strong in ICT, and we have one representative at least from the ICT industry here. But can we see a widening of those supply chains in East Asia and elsewhere, in other parts of manufacturing, into services, and even into parts of agriculture? So far, South Asia has been conspicuously absent from these supply chains, with the exception of the garments industry, and with some aspects of services like BPO and software exports. Can South Asia be integrated into these supply chains? Those are some of the many questions that arise in my mind 
on the supply chain front. Very finally, the policy or regulatory environment for international trade. Uh, nothing has happened of note in the WTO. The Doha round remains moribund. There's been a proliferation of free trade agreements, not least in this part of the world, with uh, regional trade initiatives such as ASEAN, ASEAN Plus 3, and so on, and most recently the TPP. But many of these trade agreements don't go very deep, particularly when it comes to tackling non-tariff and regulatory barriers. We'll see how far the TPP grows in this direction. And not least, at the national level, since the crisis, we've seen a creeping increase of trade regulatory protection. Some tariff increases, but a, more an increase in terms of other restrictions uh, that disrupt, not least, global supply chains. Uh, and back to the supply chain issue, what are the most important issues in terms of the regulatory environment, in terms of how to cope with how supply chains are disrupted by existing protectionism, and what needs to be done to take those barriers back to allow those supply chains to survive and prosper in the way I described a little earlier. So there I have a little menu of questions. Others may arise to the panelists as we go along. Let me start with uh, introductions. Firstly, we have uh, the Prime Minister of uh, Lithuania, uh, Andrius uh, Kublius, uh, with us. Uh, thank you very much, Prime Minister, for, uh, for, for, for joining us. Uh, we have the Mayor of Chongqing, uh, Huang Chifan. Uh, we have right next to me uh, Heinz Haller, who is Executive Vice President and Chief Commercial Officer of uh, the Dow Chemical Company uh, of the USA. We have uh, right at the end Fred Hochberg, who is Chairman of the Export-Import Bank uh, of the United States. And uh, finally, we have uh, Liam Casey, uh, Chairman and CEO of PCH International uh, here in China. Uh, welcome, uh, gentlemen. Um, a brief explanation of our format uh, for the next 50, 55 minutes or so. I'm going to start with an initial round of questions to the panelists. They will have two to three minutes to uh, answer. After that, we'll have a discussion among the panelists, and then I'll open it to you, the audience, to ask questions to the panelists and then come back to them for a final round. So uh, off uh, we go. Let me, let me start with, uh, with you, Prime Minister. Uh, Lithuania, only uh, just over 20 years ago, was part of the Soviet Union and part of the Gosplan. Uh, it made a remarkable and speedy transition to the market, along with your Baltic neighbors, uh, uh, Estonia and Latvia, and you joined the European Union in 2004. So from being hermetically sealed, as it were, from the world, trade for a small economy like yours and foreign investment has become lifeblood. What are the opportunities for trade and investment going forward in Lithuania? And what are the big policy challenges for Lithuania, but also Lithuania in the context of the European Union? Bearing in mind, of course, that trade policy is handled centrally in Brussels rather than by individual member states. Well, thanks a lot. Clearly, you explained uh, almost everything what I was uh, ready to <laughs> to say about about Lithuania, about Baltic states. First of all, of course, everybody should know geographically where we are in the northern part of Europe. Uh, and of course, when we are speaking about uh, economy and representing some European country, always at the moment there is some problem how to explain uh, what is the situation in Europe and what is the situation in our country. So uh, I would uh, very briefly say that, uh, uh, first of all, of course, uh, uh, we, during those 20 years, we went through very uh, dramatic and very rapid and very dynamic changes. As you mentioned, we became members of EU. We created a successful market economy. Of course, we uh, faced several 
a difficult crisis during those 20 years, and the last one back in 2008-2009 was the deepest, deepest one. We, we went to recession back in 2009 by minus 15% during one year in GDP terms, all three Baltic states in a very similar way. But last year we finished with 6% growth, with the deficit going down this year down to 3%, and inflation also around 3%. So if you look into the Baltic states, if you look into the uh, what we call Nordic Baltic states, five Scandinavian countries and three Baltic states, we are in a different uh, situation if you compare with uh, uh, some southern uh, European countries. So uh, what, uh, uh, what, uh, what made us uh, really quite successfully, uh, what, what helped us uh, quite successfully to overcome uh, the recent crisis, of course, was what I say always, that before moving to smart growth, you need to have smart austerity. I mean, <laughs> to move as rapidly as, as, as as it is possible with, with consolidation of your fiscal position, what we did back in 2009. And then uh, recovery, first of all, of exports lead to recovery of uh, the whole, whole economy. Uh, the Baltic states, including Lithuania, we have very open economies. Around 70% of, 70 of uh, our GDP is produced for exports. Around 75% of, of our exports are going to uh, uh, to European Union markets. So, of course, what we, uh, if, you, if you would ask what is the challenge, uh, uh, so the biggest challenge is, of course, how to have uh, exports, uh, markets, export directions more diversified, not to be dependent uh, on a very, uh, very much on uh, European markets, European markets and single market helped us very much uh, during, during uh, all those 20 years. But of course, diversification would be of a very great value. Second, of course, uh, uh, we are part of Nordic Baltic region and that is why we are really very good, all of us, we are good in, in, in uh, innovative economy and in high tech economy. And, uh, uh, and uh, that is why we also are, uh, uh, very, very much keen to stay an open economy despite all the problems. The Nordic Baltic region really is very attractive to foreign direct investment. Uh, we are, uh, we are, if to calculate the Nordic Baltic countries all together, we are something like 11th economy uh, if to take all the, all the world. And uh, an attracting uh, mm, attracting uh, foreign direct investment, it means that also you are, you, are, you are bringing new interconnections for your trade and for your possibilities for your companies, for your own companies to export to those new markets. So that is why, for example, we are very keen to have uh, Chinese companies coming and, and investing into Lithuania and, and, and uh, having an access not only to Lithuanian market of 3 million people, which is rather a small market, but also having access to to the whole Nordic Baltic region of 30 million and to the whole single, single European market of uh, 500 million. So that is what, how we see, how we see um, our, our strategy and how we see uh, the challenges. And we understand very well from our own experience uh, that if you want to have good growth of your economy, you need to, to be very open and not afraid of global competition. That is, uh, that is the first uh, rule which we learned during those 20 years of our independence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Let me turn now to uh, the Mayor of uh, Chongqing, uh, Huang Qifan. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, everyone in the room is, of course, aware that uh, Chongqing has had uh, phenomenal rates of growth. Uh, in the last few years uh, and has also been successful in attracting uh, foreign investment. Uh, perhaps you could uh, tell us a little bit more about the Chongqing story as far as trade and foreign investment is concerned and what opportunities you see for your city in the future. For Chongqing, actually, in recent three years, 
Trade import and export volume increased 10 times in 2009. It's about 5.5 billion US dollar import and export. But this year increased to 55 billion. So this is an increase for the investment foreign Investment is about one billion in zero nine. Last year is about a one. It's about ten point six billion RMB, uh, US dollar. So by doing so, we follow the international trade trend that is in about 20 or 10 years ago, when the energy is very cheap, it's about 10 US dollar per barrel. So actually, aviation and transportation is very cheap. We know that there's a famous book saying the world is flat. So when you produce a product, wherever it is located, the raw materials and spare parts can be transported from the rest of the world. And after it has been turned into a finished goods, it can be transported to another place. But after the financial crisis, this is no longer deemed as a profit because now the energy is such that the price of energy is about 100 US dollars per barrel, so the transportation cost is very high, and also logistic and uh, supply chain. If uh, we make the global transportation, this is, this is very time consuming. So in Chongqing, we have a processing trade uh, location. The production is about uh, 50 sets of computers. 30 printers, 30 million printers, etc. So this kind of production facility, the production, production capacity is about one-fifth of that of the world, which is about 20 percent. I should ask us such a question. Why can we build up such a production and a trade base in Chongqing? I think that we are changing the concept of the world is flat. And we believe that in the current world, the world is not flat at all. And we have to have the vertical consolidation or vertical integration of the key components and the parts of certain products. And we need to centralize the production of the key components in certain area. And in this way, for the key parts uh, producers and for those uh, integrators, they can really shorten their time of production. And all those uh, uh, key components, uh, producers, they can communicate with one another, and in this way they can have collaboration among each other in such a value chain. So with that uh, kind of concept in our mind, we have attracted five major players into uh, Chongqing, uh, such as uh, HP, uh, Cisco, etc. And uh, we also have uh, six uh, big manufacturers uh, located in Chongqing. And we are trying to centralize all those production and manufacturing capacities. In, in addition, we also have 600 components producers located in Chongqing. And in this way, 80% of the raw materials for the production of desktop computers are locally sourced. And within three years' time, we have completed such a target. And after the financial crisis, we are witnessing the increase of the energy prices. And we are seeing the change of the logistics systems in the world. That's why we have to reshape our mindset, the world is not flat at all. And I think that Chongqing's model is leading the development of the mainland development. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, let me turn now to uh, Heinz Haller of uh, Dow Chemical. Um, perhaps you could tell us something about how the chemical industry fits into this changing map of global supply chains, particularly in this part of the world, China, the wider Asia, East Asia perhaps, uh, firstly. And secondly, uh, what are the key regulatory issues for you in the chemical sector on, uh, on trade and investment in these, uh, in these supply chains? What are the big bottlenecks? What do you think needs to be done? 
Well, first of all, first of all, uh, the trade as such has been uh, the, the, the facilitator of growth of the company for the last 115 years, and it always has been a major part of, of our activity. When you look at uh, a company like uh, Dow Chemical, which is backward integrated into hydrocarbons and for, forward into value chains, the, the trade as such has been the facilitating uh, and precursor to investment all the time since uh, we moved uh, from uh, Michigan to uh, Texas. That was uh, probably a bigger cultural shock at the time than uh, moving from uh, Texas to, to Europe. So Asia and China in particular is uh, not something particularly foreign to us and, and uh, we have uh, been growing the company over the last 115 years by starting trade. We should never forget that uh, the chemical industry is a very asset-intense industry. It's a very productivity-oriented industry, and it's a hydrocarbons-based industry that actually needs huge capacity. And so things like labor arbitrage and stuff have never played a major role for us, but it's asset intensity. And that brings me to the second point that you uh, were, were making, regulatory uh, issues issues and uh, sort of uh, barrier of uh, in, uh, barriers of uh, ownership uh, type of stuff that that are really things of concern to us free availability of hydrocarbons that can f facilitate investment into local uh, type of economies uh, that's uh, obviously number one you need to be able to uh, be certain because of the lifespan of these investments those are investments that are made for 30 50 years as compared to the faster living type of product cycles like the IT industry. So we need to have certainty in terms of what can we do with these uh, type of assets. Are they continuously be able to operate? Are we having uh, sort of similar rules like local competition in terms of uh, access to markets locally? Are we equally, tra equally treated in terms of uh, IP once we invest? But before we invest, we need to have access, and, and free market chains are really the, 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 the first driver for growth. And I think there is an important dialogue that needs to take place with, uh, with governments to make sure that uh, you're not wasting uh, the money of your investor into an asset that is not going to stay there. And I think we need to really dissociate long integrated type into chain integrated industry versus uh, sort of assembly industries and those are probably two uh, different uh, stories. Labor arbitrage is not important for us really. We're investing, we're trading with uh, nations where we have a long term uh, interest and we should never forget uh, everything you do in life, 95% of it is touched by chemistry. So chemistry has a very, very important uh, con contribution to make to any industrial development you have in any of the nations of, uh, of, of uh, certain developments. Thank you very much. Uh, now to uh, Liam Casey, who uh, told me before we came up here that uh, he came to China for a week and 17 years later he's, uh, he's still here uh, with a wealth of uh, corporate experience uh, uh, behind him. Um, and that's what I'd like you to uh, speak to initially. Uh, uh, your company is very much at the heart of the kind of supply chains we've been talking about uh, here in China uh, to service the world, as it were. Um, now, uh, on my visits to China in the last few years, I have been hearing uh, mixed views from the foreign business community. So there are those who say that the kind of red carpet that you might have got uh, 10 years ago no longer exists. Uh, there are more protectionist obstacles, partly because there is now more competition with state-owned enterprises, um, uh, and the general environment is, uh, is more unfavorable. There are others who have to told me quite the opposite, uh, who continue to be very optimistic about an ever-expanding Chinese market and, broadly speaking, a welcome mat. How would you assess uh, the regulatory environment for you, in your industry in China? Uh, what prospects do you see for the, for the future? Th thank you. Um, well, as I said, we, we have been here 17 years. Um, came here originally in around 95, 96. Um, 
well, at the time it was to source products directly from factories in China. It was the components. And we were sourcing uh, the components that were being used in the global marketplace. Um, so we were supplying factories in Europe and in the US and in Mexico and Brazil. Um, that's all changed. We've closed offices in Sao Paulo, Brazil. We've closed offices in Budapest. We've closed offices in Guadalajara, Mexico. So now all of our production is done in China. So we're now dealing with finished product as opposed to components. Now, I could actually quote the, the mayor um, because everything he said is very accurate about the, the importance of the access to the, the raw materials and the, you know, the skill of workforce is critical. Um, but when we look at our business, the, some of the other things that change as well is that the, the market has changed. Um, now we are supplying the Chinese domestic market uh, for some of our foreign clients. Um, and actually, recently, we've started supplying some Chinese clients for the, for the domestic market. Uh, one of our new clients is one of the telephone companies here in China called Xiaomi, uh, which is a very fast-growing company here in China. Um, you know, talking about, about the regulatory, I mean, and the red carpet, when I came here first, we, I was alone, so there was, there was no red carpet. Um, and I think we missed the red carpet because we evolved over time and we grew. And um, so today we would be a substantial size business, but, um, you know, when we, as we grew, that we, were, we never fitted into the category. We were never a big brand arriving here in China, so there was no red carpet, uh, which I actually think is probably a good thing. I think one of the other things as well is that China is a very large country, and there are different there are pockets of expertise in different parts of China. I always say that um, Beijing is the political engine of, of China, Shanghai is the um, the banking finance engine of China, but Shenzhen is the the commerce engine of China. And you know, I heard earlier today I heard one of the speakers talk about um, um, about the speed in China and the Chinese and and and. And in China, the Chinese word for speed is sudu. And the Chinese word for real speed is sinjin sudu. And in our business, time to market is everything. Um, it's amazing that, um, you know, we often say that time is our number one currency and dollar is second. And the reason we say that is that, you know, the, the companies we work with, the big global brands, they're so tightly watched by analysts and stock analysts around the world they can't afford to miss a launch date of a product. If they miss a launch date of a product, it can take between 5 and 10% off their share price. Now, 5 and 10% off their share price is a huge, huge number. Um, so guaranteed of supply and guaranteed of meeting their um, ship dates are critical. And for us, for the global market, uh, the Pearl River Delta or South China is still the best location and as a company we're asset light uh, so we don't own the factories so we're very we're not biased we'll go we'll look anywhere for a factory if i can find a, a factory anywhere else in, in the world that'll make the product better um and i think on time right quality and um at the right price then we'll we'll work with them so for us we've looked uh, looked around asia and we still think that the pearl of delta for the products that we work with is still the best location. Thanks very much, Liam. Uh, Fred Hochberg, uh, you're at the heart of uh, trade finance. Uh, trade finance collapsed in the wake of the crisis. Uh, it recovered, but there was a fear back then that uh, there wouldn't be a recovery. Uh, how would you encapsulate the state of trade finance globally today and how it factors into real-world cross-border trade and investment, and what are the opportunities ahead? Uh, well, thank you. Let me see if I can try all of that. Um, trade finance, uh, I represent the Export-Import Bank of the United States. Uh, the, our volume, actually, uh, President Obama was elected in 2008. Um, in th less than three years, we're more than double the size we were three years ago. So there's been a far greater reliance on trade finance, partly a result of, a, I think, a number of factors. One, uh, actually, President Obama launched the National Export Initiative, so the United States is exporting more, producing more, consuming less relatively, so part of that. Secondly, with the global financial crisis, banks have pulled back, uh, 
and the impact of Basel III is certainly being a factor in, in banks' desire to make long-term loans, particularly loans very hard to get bank finance for more than five years. And many projects, we have a project that the bank is um, reviewing actually with Dow Chemical right now in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. And, uh, you know, that needs 12, 15-year financing, five-year financing won't do. So part of it is the um, reluctance of banks. And I would say third is there is more and more uh, trade going to emerging economies. And many banks have had um, limits or caps on what they will invest or how much of their portfolio will be in those parts of the world. So those three factors, the growth of exports under President Obama, the global financial crisis, and more trade going to emerging markets has put much more demand on export-input banks. Uh, China Exim Bank is obviously another example, uh, and a number of my other colleagues from around the world. So in an odd way, I will just add, when we credit, when we risk grade our portfolio, our portfolio actually has a higher risk rating today than three years ago. It's because transactions that were done by banks are now being done and can only be done through export credit agencies. Thank you very much. Um, let me, ar arising from, from these initial interventions, uh, Th th there are perhaps three or four common points which I want to throw back to you uh, and uh, trigger a discussion among yourselves. Um, one thing that strikes me from several comments is the changing geography of supply chains. Um, uh, I got an inkling of the changing geography of supply chains within China uh, with the migration of a lot of production now from the coastal provinces to not least places like Chongqing. Um, how do you see that panning out in the future? Uh, and you, Prime Minister, talked about the Nordic Baltic region as, uh, as a compact region for, for global supply chains, a kind of regionalization phenomenon. Uh, do, you, do you see that as part of a bigger trend whereby there's more regional clustering of production bases that are linked into global markets, as it were. Heinz Haller, you raised a regulatory issue. You said it was imperative for your company and your sector to have free access to markets, and you also mentioned the word, word, word equal treatment, i.e. non-discrimination. Now, there are many countries around the world which engage in industrial policy industrial policy of the type to favor local companies, national champions, with discriminatory as opposed to non-discriminatory treatment. Uh, how disruptive is that? How disruptive can that be to this global supply chain uh, phenomenon? Just another couple of points to throw at you. Pick any, uh, any one of them you, you wish to. Uh, what's the potential for South-South trade to increase? Trade between or among developing countries and emerging markets. How do, you, how, do you, how do you see that going? And Fred Hochberg raised a, a tantalizing point. Um, amidst all the gloom about the American economy today, uh, public finances, uh, slow job growth, and so on, uh, there are some who predict that the United States is on the verge of an export revolution which will include manufacturing. Um, is that going to happen? Okay, well, that's a broad menu. Who would like to, uh, who would like to pick up the baton? Who would like to start? Well, I'll jump in because I believe that, yes, the United States is poised for an export boom. Um, and actually, at the other end of the uh, panel here, um, Representative Heinz, uh, you know, companies like Dow, uh, the natural resources that the United States uh, as we begin to grapple with shale, gas, and, and, um, and natural resources, plus, frankly, the human capital, I think, puts the United States in a very good position for being a much stronger global player in terms of exports. Uh, exports in the last, this past year, topped $2.1 trillion, a record. However, exports are still no more than 14% of our economy. Uh, now, that's up from about 9%, so that's a dramatic growth, but... Um, 
China, it's north of 30, 35, 36%. Uh, Great Britain does not produce a lot of things, not a lot of manufacturing. It's 30% of Britain's economy. So the United States has, I think, a lot of runway ahead of it in terms of picking up export growth. And really what the President, President Obama has talked about, and, and China is talking about, is balancing our economy. We've been too much about consumption, not enough about export and investment. China, the reverse of that, one would argue, a lot of investment, a lot of export, and now is trying to rebalance in favor of consumption. So this rebalancing is actually ultimately good and ultimately does affect all these supply chains. Just to, to make a point in terms of uh, what's happening in the economy, uh, obviously hydrocarbons economies are important, but I think a fundamental uh, change that we see is the insourcing of outsourced uh, type of working steps in, in some product areas. That actually has made some supply chains very global and has uh, facilitated a lot of the building. But industrial uh, policy sort of is a very important element of that whole discussion as well, that you really need to have a manufacturing economy to really support all the other uh, type of steps further down. And, and I think uh, when you ask, will the U.S. be an export economy, I'm absolutely convinced it will be, but uh, there is a few steps that have to be happening before because there needs to be a certain amount of insourcing that you need to be in control of your uh, total supply chains, which is in, uh, posing an interesting question for the logistics uh, service companies because that, that is a world that is probably changing big time as well. And I fundamentally believe that every economy has got to look at a fully integrated manufacturing strategy again, has got to uh, basically get back into control of their manufacturing and therefore be really ready to go and change a few supply chain arrangements that we had in the past. Because it really all started with labor arbitrage, right? And labor arbitrage, in my opinion, is gone. So you're going to have to worry about your technology, and that's where uh, fair trade and uh, regulatory equality comes in. You want to be in charge of your IP, and you want to be sure that uh, your next invested dollar is going to the best place. But that is still the best place over the next 30 years, given the asset lifetime, that it stays there. So that there's a variety of uh, issues in that whole uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. Just now, the moderator kicked off a lot of questions. I just want to respond to some of them. I think for an international processing uh, and trade location or base, whether it's domestic uh, company or foreign company should be had a fair treatment, be it a state-owned enterprise or a private enterprise, a small enterprise or branded enterprise or foundries or just spare parts manufacturers, all should receive equal treatment, same tax rate, same uh, treatment, same government uh, policies. So this is the prerequisite. There should not be any discrimination or differentiated treatment. Otherwise, we will not be a world-level production fa uh, foundation or basis. And also, it's a world-level production basis. So the spare parts and uh, materials can be sourced regional, but the final product is sold all over the world. Therefore, the customs of the country should be in line with the world customs administration in terms of their systems and standards, etc. For example, the Chongqing customs administration, in order to export the goods from uh, Chongqing to other countries, it needs to go Belarus, Poland, Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, go through their customs and the trend going through all those mentioned countries and regions. These customs should have an easy and convenient standardized way to clear the customs so that uh, this can increase the efficiency. So if uh, there is an inconsistency, then it's going to prolong this. In China, we have the China Euro Bridge. In the past, we used to go it through the north one, that is uh, through Harbin in China, to Siberia, to in Russia, and then reaching Russia, only stopping and going through one country, but it's a long distance, so the efficiency is not very high. And now, in Chongqing, we have uh, the another 
one that is through Chongqing, through Xinjiang to Kazakhstan and Russia, and also to the Dutchburg in Germany. So six countries, customs administration, we signed a, a convenient agreement for custom clearance. So these seven countries, customs, once it passes through one inspection of one of the uh, customs administrations, then the other administra uh, customs administration does not need to inspect the good. So we have a unified railway system arrangement as well. We have the uh, fixed and designated uh, fees for railway transportation with a fixed time, etc. So that for in each container, the price for transportation in seven countries are all the unified prices. Therefore, this uh, cross-border railway um, agreement as well as the cross-border customs uh, and nutrition arrangement are all unified. So now we're talking about international trade, so there needs to have an international settlement. So once you pay the spare parts, you pay with a certain currency, you are making uh, the pro uh, production and processing here in China, so we also pay in RMB. So in uh, China, in the United States, in Europe, there are different currencies, but in mainland China, we do ha not have the off-land price for the settlement. So, if in China, this kind of off-land financing is uh, not uh, linked with that of the rest of the world, then this is bottleneck for international trade. So from China's perspective, we need to further open to the outside world so that this kind of uh, production line, especially this kind of uh, international trade settlement uh, systems can be set up in Chongqing, in Shanghai. If we can do a proper job in these areas, I believe the world trade uh, can be better. Prime Minister? Yeah, if, uh, I would like just to continue and, uh, and to add something about Nordic Baltic region. But mm. to continue what uh, Mir said, really it's very important uh, uh, this way of resolving uh, uh, the logistic problems. And I remember well how three years ago perhaps we had the first uh, uh, Asian uh, European transport ministers meeting in Vilnius and I was presiding at that meeting and exactly those issues how to agree on uh, transport routes on railways routes from from China from from uh, from Asia to Europe uh, really that was very interesting to to see and to follow how how rapidly things started to uh, become reality uh, so, and in that case, really, uh, the Nordic Baltic cooperation is also very, uh, very important, because again, those ideas to have uh, such kind of conference they match from uh, our Nordic Baltic uh, transport ministers, uh, which uh, saw uh, really a good opportunity to have such a, such good, good, uh, good cooperation with uh, Chinese, Chinese uh, counterparts. Uh, Nordic Baltic. Uh, Cooperation, I would, uh, I would name it as some, some kind of very strong regional clusterization. Starting from uh, political clusterization, we have very good uh, political uh, traditions of political cooperation. Then going into all the areas of economical and financial cooperation. For example, uh, in Lithuania, we have something like 90% of financial institutions which came, uh, banks which, came, which are coming from, from Scandinavia. Then we have our major trade partners, of course, are Scandinavian countries. Major investors, again, are, are Scandinavians, uh, uh, Danes or Swedes. And uh, we are benefiting. We, as a, not a very large country with three million inhabitants, we are benefiting out, out from that. And uh, being part of this Nordic Baltic region just now means a lot because it has its own brand. As fiscally prudent region, as the region which really has very strong advantages in, uh, in development of innovative and, and high tech technologies and economies, and uh, the region which is very much focused on, on, on exports. So 
that is, I don't know if that is a unique experience of our region or not, but, uh, uh, but we, are, we are really very much enjoying uh, being part of, of, of uh, all the different regions which merge in, in, in one, in one uh, very, very, very nice name, Nordic Baltic region. Uh, and, uh, and that is what, where we see the goal really to, to look forward how to move ahead with, with that internal cooperation even more. Okay. Thank you. The Prime Minister was being uh, modest. Uh, Lithuania is the largest country in the Baltic region by population, <laughs> ahead of Latvia and Estonia. Uh, Liam? Yeah, on the, the whole global trade flows, I mean, we, we manage three flows. We manage the flow of information, the flow of product, and then the flow of cash. And again, getting the, um, that's what the mayor said about the, the different customs, the product to entry into a country. I mean, for us, this is some of the biggest risks. Now it's getting much better. And um, again, we think that, you know, once this improves and with the tools that are available today, the, especially the um, access to data, um, because data has always been the gap. And if we can track the information, we manage the physical flow of goods. Um, with that, we can manage the financial flow of goods. And the one barrier to the financial flow of goods is mostly it's the, it's the banks. The banks, when, anytime I sit with a supply chain finance a bank, talk about supply chain finance, the first thing they'll mention is um, letters of credit. Now, letters of credit were invented by, I think it was Marco Polo, started to use them first. And he didn't have Google Earth or any of the other tools that are available today that you can use to, tra to track global trade. Um, and again, when you look at some of our product, I can take a product from a production line in Shenzhen to a consumer in New York in three days, uh, including the production. Um, I can take it to Tokyo next day. I can take it to here in China. So with, when you collapse uh, the time involved in the trade flows, you also collab collapse the risk that's involved. So, and, and the thing is, we, we, we see a great opportunity for disrupting uh, supply chain finance. Um, it, you know, consumer finance has been disrupted by companies like PayPal, companies like Square, companies like Stripe. Now, these are all in, created by fantastic, young, uh, super intelligent people who don't have business experience, but they have experience of going to Starbucks and buying a coffee or going to uh, 7-Eleven and buying a pack of gum. So what I want to do is we want to, you know, in, get those guys involved in, you know, when they see a billion dollars of receivables, how do you disrupt that? Because the banks certainly are not going to do it. Um, so that's one of the exciting things. We actually think that the Chinese banks are probably some of the, the ones that are probably most innovative in the space at the moment. And again, one of the things that we, t we say in, in, in business, and it's, it's again what the mayor was saying about the customs, um, in, in business today, geography is history. And it, it's, that's the way it's going because when we think about a, ro a rollout on a product for a client, for us, we look at a global rollout and how fast we can do it. And in the past, it was so it was very regional, whereas today it's much more global. I was just going to add, uh, bankers like letters of credit because they like the fees they collect on them. <laughs> it, it, uh, we we try and encourage uh, credit insurance and a number of other things that are far less expensive. Uh, but I think many banks they still like letters of credit because they're cumbersome and they're costly and they generate nice fees. And uh, but I would totally agree with you when. We could work with anybody who's buying U.S. products with, through credit insurance far less expensively and far faster. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Let me uh, open it now to uh, you, uh, the audience. Uh, uh, please feel free to, uh, to ask questions to any one of or several uh, members of the panel. Uh, and please introduce yourselves uh, with your affiliation, if any. Uh, when you do so. Uh, who would like to ask the first question? The gentleman over there. I'll, t I'll take a, f a round of questions and then get back to the panel. Thank Please. you, Mr. Chairman. I'm David Campbell-Bannerman. I'm member of the European Parliament for the East of England, and I'm on the International Trade Committee of the Parliament. Uh, so I've been involved in free trade agreements like Japan is coming up, India, uh, Australia, New Zealand. Um, I just wanted to ask a question in light of that. With the World Trade Organization being quite successful, despite Doha, in, in driving down tariffs around the world, 
and the fact that uh, Japan, for example, is not in trade blocks. Um, is the era of trade blocks actually fading? Is, you know, is actually the, the reason to have these trade blocks uh, actually diminishing because it's now global and the World Trade Organization and tariffs in general are falling? Uh, does that mean that actually they've had their, they've had their um, day, such as the EU? Thank you. Oh, oh including the EU. Interesting. Um, <laughs> right. Um, any other takers for an initial round of questions? Please don't be shy. If not, I'll get straight back to, uh, to the panel. Any, any takers for that question? Yeah. So the products that, that, that we work with and the, um, the kind of clients we work with, they um, sell a lot of their products online. There's a phenomenon in the States at the moment called Kickstarter, which is a crowdsourcing or crowdfunding for projects. Um, when our clients and startup clients go on and they put their products up there, they'll sell products to 100 countries. Okay, So the consumers are driving it more so than... So if consumers in Japan want to buy a product, they're going to go online and they're going to source it and they're going to find it. And what we're finding is that the entrepreneurs and the startups are finding ways to supply. So I think that the market is going to move it. And I think that the tariffs will have to change towards that. I'd like to say something. I think that in terms of the uh, World Trade Organization, it deals with uh, the uh, tariffs and the duty agreement. They are trying to reduce the tariffs. And in the uh, coming years, I think that there are three issues that the uh, WTO should pay attention to. Otherwise, it will lose its uh, functions. Because now we have been witnessing the decrease of the tariffs and duties, but how can the customers of different countries work together to provide their services? And in China, you know, for most of the goods, they have the electronic IDs being packed to the products, and for the customs in China, once a product is packed and inspected by simple customs, then this product can go through all the other customs inside China. And I think that the information can be shared by different uh, customers of different countries. And I think that this issue should become an issue which the WTO should pay attention to. That by that, I mean, we need to have a sharing of information among all the customs. And in this way, we can facilitate the trade. And in addition, we see the increase of the processing trade in the world. I think that in the coming uh, years, we need to have the sharing of the information among the different countries. And I think that in the coming years, we need to have the sharing of the information among the different countries. And I think that in the coming years, we need to have the sharing of the information among the different countries. And I think that in the coming years, we need to have the sharing of the information among the different countries. To make the payments, how are we going to settle all those payments? And for the Chinese customers, they tend to buy from the American market. And how should the customs investigate or inspect all those puzzles going through? And we need to have international rules and regulations on that. Without those international rules and regulations, I think that the e-commerce trade will be hindered and the development of the e-commerce trade cannot be developed. And in China, we have a lot of uh, B2C and B2B trade. And uh, this has created some new issues for us. And we have to consider the new regulations to uh, put them in control. And uh, the third issue is the e-commerce related currency. And we need to consider the convertibility of the different currencies used for the e-commerce trade. And I think that those are the three issues that the WTO need to consider against the new backdrop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Huang.
next question, please. You, sir. Um, hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jerry Matthews from Bain and Company. Um, uh, we, we recently uh, issued a report on the consumers in China and the way they think, uh, which is quite different from maybe consumers in, in, in developed economies um, in terms of the patterns and the ways they, they consume goods and they buy and, and the loyalty to brands. How do you see that affecting supply chains, which are mostly demand driven, in terms of their model and their operation here in China and Asia? versus the Western world or the developed world, and how could that affect trade? So could we see a different model of supply chains developing for Asia, very different from the developed world, and what complexity could that bring to organizations, as well as global trade? Thank you. Thank you. You, sir. I mean, you're referencing to the hydrocarbons, but the extent to which sourcing from grains or other natural materials is also impacting the nature of the trade flows. Any other questions? Yes, madam. Thank you. More important in the future, and uh, do you think there will be any gaining rules in this respect? I think that in Chongqing, you know, Chongqing is an inland city in China, and we do not have any uh, borders or customs, customs in Chongqing. And uh, if uh, we like to change our inland city to a kind of a border city, then we can leverage the other means of transportation, for example, the air transportation, and all we can consider the development of our train transportation. And uh, since we have the train transportation connecting Chongqing with the other countries and other cities, uh, that has something to do with the customs. And uh, we have been in contact with uh, the customs of uh, several countries, including the customs of uh, Lithuania. And uh, we are trying to set up a very convenient uh, uh, custom agreement. And the Premier Wen Jiabao signed such an agreement with uh, President Putin in the year of 2010. And after the establishment of this agreement, we actually set up a Euro Asia railway bridge. And the for those high-end products in the past, uh, it, is, it was very difficult for all those high-end products to go through such a uh, railway bridge because of the different practices of the customs. And originally, the, for the Chinese goods, uh, they had to be transported to the European market through the uh, port cities such as Guangzhou and Shanghai. And we had to ship all those products by the uh, marine transportation or by ship transportation. And the, and then now we think that uh, it is uh, a little bit easier for us to develop the train transportation system connecting Chongqing and the other countries, especially those in the Central Asia. And I think that uh, the convenience of the customs uh, should be very important for the trade development in the world. 
Thank you, Mayor Huang. Uh, gentlemen, uh, the, uh, the previous two questions, uh, would anyone care to, uh, care to respond? Maybe I can uh, react to your question on uh, is the hydrocarbons economy going to be uh, persistent and, or, or is, it gonna, is the, uh, the green uh, type of backward integration into hydrocarbon equivalents going to change anything? I think technically we're a long way away before uh, the green uh, raw material input will, will make a dent into the overall uh, material flow balances uh, of the world. I think what's clear on the energy side that uh, we're seeing a lot of alternative energy that is changing the, the shorter supply chain, the national supply chains a little bit with uh, wind energy, solar energy and type uh, of alternative uh, gases uh, out, out of uh, agricultural waste type of stuff. There is a, that's a totally different uh, problem in terms of that's local supply into an energy grid, which uh, most of the nations actually have a bigger problem than uh, organizing a global supply chain. And, and you've seen that here in China with the demise of the wind industry, because the wind industry basically forgot to ask, can we feed into the state grids? And that has led to a, uh, an interesting uh, sort of uh, delay of uh, wind energy investment. So there is a lot of regulatory type of uh, uh, discussions that need to take place, a lot of rules and regulations that are important because the, the, the technology behind that, that's global supply chains to that sort of got disrupted by a lack of a clear uh, statement, a clear policy statement. So very often the root causes for disruptions of supply chains are coming from, uh, from the unexpected end because the, 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 the public-private partnerships have not really been uh, clarifying uh, all the rules. And that's true in Europe with the feed-in tariffs for solar. We have a huge issue with solar right now, which is really disrupting a lot of supply chains for the wrong reasons, because the, the, the regulatory bodies and the producing, the producing industry haven't talked to each other. And I think uh, we can talk all about tariffs. In my opinion, tariffs are not the issue. The issue are clear views of what you want to achieve and how global these supply chains are. And is it B2C? Is it small products? So, and then I, I would uh, actually agree with Liam that you can get anything within uh, probably three or four days from around the world. It's a bit more difficult uh, to supply a 300,000 ton oil tanker into uh, a, a two billion dollar asset and uh, I'm sure uh, my friends from Reliance would agree with that. So I think we need to be a little bit more specific on industries on what uh, it needs to be done to supply chain, what, where the trade security needs to be. I agree that uh, it's easy to buy a computer on the internet and ship it from here to the US. It's a bit more difficult where you have huge volumes and I think that those really need to be two different discussions because it's different regulatory bodies, it's different uh, environmental standards that you need to have, it's, big, it, it's a lot bigger risk. The credit risks, if you ship a super tanker uh, of uh, oil, are a little different uh, than uh, uh, shipping uh, an Apple computer. And I think we've got to be really careful not to generalize those sorts of issues, but look at industry sectors. Agricultural industry is another one. That's, that's probably the one with the biggest potential for deregulation and therefore disruptions of supply chains. The unfortunate thing is nobody wants that, particularly not the big, the big producing nations. Mm -hmm. uh, so just on the gentleman's question from Ben, um, we actually, our e-commerce business is, and our B2B, B2C business is by brand as opposed to by e-tailer. And we see some very interesting trends when we look at the Chinese uh, brands. Um, the basket size is much bigger than, say, the U.S. Um, shoppers um, when, they, when they shop in China. So that's one thing that's of interest. Prime Minister? Uh, well, briefly, just to continue what, uh, what Mayor was speaking about, uh, how, uh, how it's important uh, in supply chain uh, uh, good logistics and what, what we can achieve and... Uh, uh, and what uh, we are trying to do together with our Chinese counterparts on, on, on bringing some new, new, uh, new arrangements. So, uh, what Mayor was speaking, shipping goods from, from China to Europe, it takes, as our experts are saying, around 45 days. If uh, those uh, trains will go from uh, China to Europe, <coughs> according to those arrangements which are which we are making and uh, where we experience the first shuttle train 
from China coming to, to Lithuania, which, uh, which was called very nice name, Sun. So it takes somewhere around of 12 or 14 days. So that is the difference in supply chain, what you can achieve. Then uh, on, uh, on some uh, questions on uh, specific, uh, uh, specific markets, specific uh, attitudes uh, in, 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 in different markets, I am not an expert in, on those issues, and I do not know uh, very well the Chinese market, and I cannot say anything uh, very specifically. But uh, from our experience, uh, what I can, uh, in a very brief way, uh, to show. You know, back in 1995, we were, uh, we were negotiating free trade agreement with the European Union, still, still uh, on our accession, uh, accession way. And just now, when uh, I have a lot of meetings with uh, our neighbors from, from Ukraine, from Moldova, from, from uh, South Caucasus, and they are going through negotiations on free trade with, with, with the European Union, sometimes I hear a very similar language. They're saying, well, we are different. Uh, we cannot uh, go so smoothly with negotiations. You should, in Europe, we'll, you should look into our, into our specific situation. And I remember very well 1995 when we were negotiating uh, the same. I remember how we were afraid of some items in free trade agreement uh, uh, which was proposed. And uh, at the end we agreed. And I don't remember what we were afraid of. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't, uh, does not create it for us any, any kind of big problems. All, all our specific issues. Thank you, Prime Minister. We have Two minutes. Uh, uh, no time for any more questions, I'm afraid. Uh, would any members of the panel have any, any final thoughts based on, uh, on your interventions and our discussion, some final takeaways for the, uh, for, for the audience? I'll, I'll jump in quickly. Um, one of the things that uh, is, is needed um, will be, and it relates to what the mayor talked about in some way, and that is, a greater transparency and greater agreement on uh, what are the terms of trade because uh, for many years, 30 odd years, uh, the OECD uh, set the terms of agreement so there was a framework so trade finance was not distorting. Uh, we, have a we have now a situation where we have China, Brazil, India, large industrialized countries, China the largest export in the world not a member of the OECD. So moving towards a framework where there's transparency and agreement on that, I believe will take finance somewhat out of the shadows and but also keep it in the background so that we have products and goods and services competing on their own merits and just make sure that finance is a facilitator but not the dominant force. So I think that's one thing we need to work on in the next few years. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. Uh, we are about to close. Uh, uh, my uh, final task is to leave the audience with a couple of final takeaways from our whole discussion. Uh, and uh, I have only two in mind. One is, uh, despite the current global economic gloom, uh, I noticed a fair amount of optimism that uh, supply chains can continue going global and widen and deepen. Um, uh, so that's one thing to bear in mind. The second thing to bear in mind is, is the regulatory environment. Tariffs are much less important now. And the issue, the uh, Mayor Huang uh, talked about e-commerce, he talked about customs. The issue now is very much about non-tariff and regulatory barriers, not just in manufacturing, not just in the obvious area of agriculture, where, of course, they are highest, but also in a whole panoply of services infrastructure where actually protection behind the border, regulatory, is higher than it is in manufacturing. But these are precisely the areas, because they're so complicated, because they're so politically sensitive, that elude agreement in the WTO, in FTAs, and in other forums. On that note, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you for the panel.